Hi, my name is Jennifer Goldschmied, and I am from the Department of Psychiatry and the Chronobiology and Sleep Institute at the University of Pennsylvania. I would like to welcome you to the current session entitled, We Should All Be Studying Sleep, Why Understanding Sleep is Fundamental to Elucidating Psychopathology. Almost every neuropsychiatric disorder is associated with sleep disturbance. And while sleep is often viewed as just a symptom of these disorders, there is mounting evidence that sleep disturbance can actually precipitate a range of psychiatric conditions. We also know that some interventions targeted to improve sleep can sometimes improve symptoms of these disorders as well, perhaps suggesting that sleep disturbance may play a larger mechanistic role in their development and maintenance. In this session, we'll be discussing how sleep is impaired in depression, schizophrenia, substance use, and PTSD, and what these impairments and their subsequent interventions may reveal about the mechanisms of these disorders. We aim to convince you that the study of sleep is essential to the investigation of the pathophysiology, maintenance, and treatment of neuropsychiatric disorders, and that by studying sleep, we may ultimately identify novel potential targets for intervention. Here, you'll hear from our first two presenters via this virtual symposium, and we encourage you to read the abstract of the last two presenters at sobp.org slash meetings slash 2020 annual meeting. Thank you. So uh, we've been learning more and more about how neuroplasticity may be implicated in major depression. And today I'd like to, to share some insights from sleep research that may be able to shed some light on these hypotheses. Uh, so here's an outline of today's talk. First, we'll lay some groundwork and discuss some background about sleep. Then we'll discuss what sleep looks like in major depression. We'll then switch gears a bit to talk about the effects of sleep deprivation on mood. And lastly, we'll connect all of this to neuroplasticity and I'll present some preliminary data to support some of these ideas. Um, okay, so what is sleep? Um, so in 1982, Bourbet and colleagues proposed the two process model of sleep regulation. In this model, there are two drives that work together to stimulate sleep-wake behavior. The first of these is the homeostatic sleep drive, which is similar to other homeostatic drives like hunger and thirst, in that it builds over time and reaches a critical threshold in which the drive must be satisfied. So in this case, over the course of a waking day, our drive for sleep increases until we reach some critical point where we feel so tired or sleepy that sleep must occur and we fall asleep. As sleep then occurs, this drive dissipates and then we wake feeling refreshed. The second of the two processes is the circadian rhythm. So as opposed to the homeostatic drive for sleep, the circadian rhythm controls alertness. And we see here that alertness actually changes over the course of the day. So there's a dip at around 3 to 4 p.m. in many adults, which is when we would typically see long lines at Starbucks. Um, and then we reach peak alertness at around 9 p.m., after which there is typically a steady decline. So when we put these two processes together, what we see is that the maximal time for sleep happens in the late evening when our circadian alertness signal begins to decrease and our homeostatic drive is at its highest. So this can partially explain why we sleep, but how do we study sleep? So we use EEG and with it we can visually score sleep using the predominant waveforms present over the course of the night. So for example, stage one sleep is associated with theta waves, and individuals woken from this stage will often say that they weren't sleeping at all. Stage two sleep is associated with spindles and K-complexes, and is general, generally deeper than stage one. Stage three sleep, or slow wave sleep, is associated with sleep slow waves, or waveforms that are both slow in frequency and high in amplitude. And this is the deepest and most restorative stage of sleep, from which individuals will wake typically feeling very groggy. Lastly, REM is a stage associated with dreaming and memory consolidation. So here on the right, you see a hypnogram illustrating how we cycle through these stages over the course of the night. And you can see that slow wave sleep often occurs most in the first half of the night, whereas REM occurs most in the second half of the night. Okay, so let's now discuss sleep in major depression specifically. 
Um, so I don't need to review symptoms of depression in this group, um, but the classic profile of an unmedicated individual with major depression has longer sleep onset latency or the amount of time it takes to fall asleep, increased sleep fragmentation, early morning awakenings or waking one to two hours before one's desired wake time, REM abnormalities um, that include increased amount of REM, shorter time to begin REM or what we call REM latency, an increased REM density or the actual amount of eye movements that occurs during REM, and lastly, slow wave abnormalities that I'll come back to. So here's a hypnogram similar to the one I showed previously with a healthy individual at the top and an individual with major depression at the bottom. And what you can note is the increased sleep fragmentation, lack of slow wave sleep, increased REM, and shortened REM latency. So I previously mentioned slow wave abnormalities and using visually scored sleep, there's ample evidence of reduced slow wave sleep in major depression. But we can also look at the underlying frequency structure of EEG using power spectral analysis. And here we can appreciate other differences. So for example, if you contrast this red line with the dark blue line here, um, and the, the red line indicates those with major depression, the blue line being healthy controls, you can see that not only is slow wave activity power lower in the beginning of the night, but the dissipation rate indicated here by the slope of the line is also different. And that slope even is different even when you take into account the starting point. Um, and here I want to note that we believe that there are significant sex differences, and these data specifically were taken from males with, with um, major depression. So are these differences in slow wave activity in major depression important? And we think the answer is yes. Um, and that's because we believe that slow wave activity is an index of sleep homeostasis. We know this because after sleep deprivation, slow wave activity increases, and this response is correlated with the amount of time spent awake. So slow wave activity here, depicted in teal, um, and we see that most slow wave occurs in that first sleep cycle and then decreases over the rest of the night. Peak slow wave activity here reflects the sleep drive and the dissipation or the decay rate reflects the recovery function. So this may mean that individuals with depression may have impaired sleep homeostasis. And this may indicate that other homeostatic drives may also be impaired. Okay. So we're going to switch gears for a minute and talk about sleep in uh, sleep deprivation. So first, in healthy individuals, we know that sleep loss increases depressed mood, anger, and frustration. That experimental sleep deprivation limits coping skills and increases the perception of stress. And sleep restriction, or sleep that's limited to about four to five hours a night, disturbs mood increasingly across seven days. But we also know that those with depression show brief symptom improvement following sleep deprivation, which is a completely paradoxical finding. So this is a figure that depicts just an N of one across several days. And what you see is that over one night of total sleep deprivation, mood ratings improve significantly, but return to baseline levels immediately after recovery sleep. And we know that sleep deprivation results in rapid antidepressant effects in about half of those people with major depression. So this plot is from a recent meta-analysis from our group uh, looking at 66 studies of sleep deprivation in depression, which demonstrated that 50% of individuals showed an antidepressant response to sleep deprivation. And here you can see that responders to sleep deprivation show an increasing improvement in mood as the total sleep deprivation continues. And for decades, researchers have tried to identify the mechanism of this antidepressant effect by examining different aspects of sleep and their contribution to mood by selectively depriving individuals of certain stages of sleep. Now with REM, this actually can be a pretty difficult endeavor because REM is physiologically similar to waking. So in order to reduce REM, you actually have to wake the individual up 
which confounds reducing total sleep time. Um, however, because slow wave activity is a robust drive and you're very, you're very um, deeply sleeping while this is happening, you can selectively reduce sleep slow waves. Sorry. Um, so, oh, sorry, hold on one second, I messed up my notes. Okay, back. Okay, so, um, in an elegant paradigm pioneered by Dirk Jan Dyke, um, real-time EEG is continuously monitored during sleep by technicians, and whenever two delta waves appear within 15 seconds, an acoustic stimulus is administered. Uh, this is typically delivered via headphones or a speaker that's mounted above the individual's head during sleep. And the stimulus is then repeated if no response occurs. So in this way, we're able to significantly reduce sleep slow wave activity without decreasing total sleep time. But does it work? So here's some data from a pilot study that we ran in 2015 that shows that we are able to significantly reduce slow wave activity. Now, unfortunately, we can't completely eliminate slow wave, and that's because it's a really robust homeostatic drive. However, we were here able to reduce it by about 25% in both healthy controls and individuals with depression. Now, we do note some changes in sleep architecture, as would be expected. So both groups showed an increase in stage two, and in healthy controls, we saw a decrease in stage one, and in those with depression, we also saw that REM decrease. So what about mood? So in 2015, our group showed that slow wave disruption improved mood. And before that, actually in 2011, using a very similar protocol, Lance Ness and colleagues showed a very similar pattern where depression scores improved following slow wave disruption. So potentially, sleep deprivation may improve mood due to the absence of sleep slow waves. Okay, so now we've, we've discussed that both sleep deprivation and selective slow wave sleep deprivation improves mood and depression. But we actually still don't know what the mechanism is. So I'd like to now turn to the ties between sleep and neuroplasticity. So several lines of evidence have converged suggesting that neuroplasticity is impaired in depression. So in addition to the behavioral evidence of learning and memory impairments, we also see structural evidence, including reduced gray matter volume and loss of dendritic branching and dendritic spine complexity. In animal models, we see that chronic stress decreases expression of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, a key component in regulating neuroplasticity. We also note that serum BDNF levels in depression are reduced and are correlated with depression severity. So interestingly, neuroplasticity is also tied to sleep. So the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis is an elegant and a bit controversial of a theory that suggests that during wake, synaptic potentiation occurs and synaptic strength builds across the day, which is very similar to the homeostatic drive for sleep, and they may be related in that way. And then during sleep, and specifically during slow wave sleep, synaptic downscaling occurs, and that rebalances synaptic weight and allows for renormalization. So Christoph Nissen's group at the University of Freiburg and Bern um, build off of the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis and recently proposed that sleep deprivation results in antidepressant effects because over the course of normal waking, individuals with depression don't build adequate synaptic strength to reach an optimal window of LTP in inducibility, which you can see here depicted in pink. However, if sleep deprivation occurs here, um, and synaptic potentiation is allowed to continue building, individuals with depression are able to reach that window. Um, and you can see here that individuals that are healthy actually come out of that window of LTP inducibility during sleep deprivation, which is why we might see memory impairments during sleep deprivation and mood impairments in that group. 
So we were really interested in this model and decided to investigate these ideas looking specifically at BDNF. So here's our study timeline. We brought folks in for four nights. The first night was an adaptation night where all of our individuals had a nine hour sleep opportunity and had an opportunity to adapt to the sleep lab environment. The second night served as the baseline night and individuals were also given a nine hour sleep opportunity. Participants then experienced 36 hours of total sleep deprivation, followed by a recovery night where they were given a 12 hour sleep opportunity. So today I'll actually be presenting some very preliminary data just based on a subset of our samples that whose BDNF was able to be processed at about the halfway point of the study. So this subset was mostly female and had a very mild level of depression as assessed by the Hamilton. And from this table, you can note that following total sleep deprivation, total sleep time increased in both groups as would be expected and stage one decrease. So what about BDNF? So what we found was a significant interaction between group and condition with those in the, the group of individuals with major depression showing a significant decrease in BDNF following recovery sleep. And we looked at correlation and correlational analysis revealed that the higher the initial Hamilton score, the lower the BDNF was following recovery. And this illustrates a potentially intimate relationship between depression severity specifically and changes in BDNF following sleep deprivation. We did not, however, see any associations between BDNF and behavioral measures of learning and memory. So we did observe some improvements in accuracy on the NBAC and efficiency on the VOLT, but this just may reflect learning effects. And in both of these cases, there is a significant increase in performance from sleep deprivation to post-recovery in both, in both groups. Okay, so to summarize, what do we know about sleep? Well, that both a homeostatic drive and circadian rhythm contribute to the need for sleep and our ability to remain alert. We also know that abnormalities in slow wave activity potentially reflect impairments in sleep homeostasis in depression. We know that both total sleep deprivation and selective slow wave de deprivation improve mood. And lastly, we discussed that sleep and potentially slow wave activity specifically contribute to the downscaling of synaptic strength. From our preliminary data, we saw that BDNF significantly decreased in individuals with depression following recovery sleep, but not in healthy individuals. And that this change was not reflected in behavioral measures of learning and memory. And so this may reflect the reduction in synaptic strength and exit from that optimal window of LTP inducibility and may indicate that changes in neuroplasticity might mediate the relationship between sleep and mood in MDD. But of course, much more research is needed to further explore these ideas, and we're really looking forward to being able to take a look at our full sample when we're able to get back in the lab and run the rest of our BDNF samples. So with that, I would like to acknowledge all of the truly exceptional people I've been fortunate to work with at both the University of Michigan and the University of Pennsylvania. I'd also like to thank our funding sources, all of the individuals who volunteered to participate in our studies, and a thank you to the Society of Biological Psychiatry for the opportunity to present this work. Thank you so much. So schizophrenia is a neurodevelopmental disorder in which genetic and environmental risk factors interact, leading to an emergence of symptoms, usually in late adolescence or early adulthood. Until fairly recently, drug development has focused on treating the florid, psychotic symptoms of schizophrenia. But even after these symptoms are successfully treated, cognitive deficits remain. Um, and these cognitive deficits contribute to the chronic disability that leaves approximately 80% of individuals with schizophrenia unemployed. Since schizophrenia strikes young, 
and affects about 1% of the population worldwide. This has staggering economic and psychosocial costs. We don't understand the causes of the cognitive deficits and consequently we lack effective treatments. So this is a huge unmet medical need. NIMH has poured millions of dollars into large scale studies to identify measures of cognition and targets for treatment. And to my mind, a fundamental limitation to this work is that these studies only measure cognition in cross section at a single point in time. While this provides a valid snapshot of function, it misses the critical aspects of learning and memory that happen offline, over time, and particularly with sleep. After encoding, memories are not just stabilized like a snapshot, they are enhanced and transformed in the brain. And these consolidation processes happen offline, excuse me, outside of awareness and continue over days or even years. And much of this so-called evolution of memory is mediated by sleep. Now, this is not a new idea. This is a Roman rhetorician from 95 AD. It is a curious fact of which the reason is not obvious that the interval of a single night will greatly increase the strength of the memory, perhaps because the power of recollection undergoes a process of ripening and maturing during the night. But subjecting this to experimental study is relatively new. And over the last 20 years, this is the cover of Science in 2001, over the last 20 years, there has been a virtual explosion of research on the role of sleep and memory. And much of this research has been carried out in the lab of my friend and collaborator, Bob Stickles. He's been a real pioneer. And unfortunately, I don't have time to give you a flavor of the breadth and depth of this work and, and the importance of sleep-dependent memory consolidation across the lifespan. but Suffice it to say that this work, this body of literature has led to a paradigm shift. Not all of our learning occurs while we're awake. Rather than being a passive restorative state, sleep is an active period of cognitive functioning that facilitates learning and memory. And at this point, this work has been, this fact has been so clearly established that Bob's work has moved from the cover of science to the cover of Scientific American. So this work motivated us to look at sleep and its role in cognition in schizophrenia. And to do that, we used the finger tapping motor sequence task, which is a simple procedural learning task. And what you do is you place your hand, the left hand on the fingers on the on a keyboard and you type repeatedly, as quickly and accurately as possible, a sequence. You do that for 30 seconds, you rest for 30 seconds, and you do that 12 times. So it's a simple task. And this is what learning looks like in young, healthy subjects. So on the y-axis, we have the number of sequences correctly typed for 30 seconds. On the x-axis, we have the training trials, the 12 training trials, and learning um, has this steep learning curve, and then it eventually plateaus by the end of the 12 trials. And it doesn't matter if you do this in the evening at 10 p.m. or in the morning at 10 a.m., the learning curve looks virtually the same. But when subjects come back the next morning without further practice, there is a significant improvement. And importantly, this, this improvement depends on sleep. An equal interval of wake does not give rise to significant improvement. So what happens when we give this task to patients with schizophrenia? First, what I'm showing you is just a demographically matched sample of controls showing the canonical learning curve. And after a night of sleep, they show significant improvement. So I'm putting up a new y-axis for the patients and um, they also show um, 
intact learning, both in terms of the amount learned, the number of sequences they improved from the first to the last three trials of training, but also in the proportion. And so there's no difference um, in learning. However, when they come back after a night of sleep, there is a selective failure of overnight improvement. So this is demonstrating impaired sleep-dependent memory consolidation in schizophrenia. But what part of sleep is culpable? Sleep is not a unitary state. So what's important is that this failure of overnight improvement occurred in the context of reduced sleep spindle activity, in this case, spindle density. So spindles are these defining oscillations of stage two non-rapid eye movement sleep. They're these powerful bursts of activity, 12 to 15 hertz activity in this waxing waning envelope, hence the name spindles. And they are thought to be a key mechanism of, synapt of synaptic plasticity that mediates memory consolidation during sleep. And importantly, in schizophrenia, the deficits were correlated. Patients showed reduced spindles that correlated with their reduction in sleep-dependent memory. So the more spindles they had, the more they improved. Consistent with the hypothesis that the spindle deficit caused the memory deficit in schizophrenia. And this causal hypothesis is consistent with optogenetic, pharmacological, and neurostimulation studies that show that increasing spindles improves memory and decreasing them can actually impair memory. So we also show reduced spindles in antipsychotic naive early course psychotic patients. And when we divide these early course patients into those with a diagnosis of schizophrenia versus other non-schizophrenia psychoses, we're showing the deficit only in the schizophrenia, suggesting some level of specificity. Um, it also suggests that the spindle deficits are not due to the drugs we use to treat schizophrenia and are not due to chronicity. We see the same thing for spindle amplitude. Let me just define spindle density. It's the number of spindles per minute in stage two non-rapid eye movement sleep. And spindles, regardless of what kind of psychotic disorder you had, spindles correlated with worse executive function. Um, so the more spindles you had, the faster you perform trails B and the fewer errors you made on the Wisconsin card store test. We also show, showed spindle deficits in young, non-psychotic first-degree relatives of schizophrenia patients. And regardless of whether you were an early course patient with schizophrenia, had another psychosis, were a relative or control, spindles, both density and spindle amplitude, which is the power of the spindle, correlated with IQ. And this is consistent with the large basic literature um, that finds that spindles correlate with IQ and a range of cognitive measures. And so this literature is consistent with the hypothesis that the spindle deficit is an endophenotype of schizophrenia or a marker of genetic vulnerability that predates the onset of illness, persists throughout its course and impairs cognitive function. And so, <laughs> Excuse me. The question then becomes, can we target spindle physiology to treat cognitive deficits in schizophrenia? And I think the answer to that question is yes, but we have to understand the mechanisms of the spindles to target them. So fortunately, there are decades of complementary studies in rodents and cats and, and other animals have given us a pretty good idea of spindle um, mechanisms. So spindles um, are generated in the thalamic reticular nucleus, which is this thin nucleus that is, whoops, that is strategically positioned between the cortex and the rest of the thalamus and mediates the interactions between the cortex and the thalamus. It's a gating nucleus. And so for the purposes of this talk, the 
um, the TRN has two, the thalamic reticular nucleus has two important functions. It's inhibiting these thalamocortical neurons, um, powerfully inhibiting these thalamocortical neurons. And during sleep, this powerful inhibition leads to the burst firing that gives rise to spindle. And during wake, this powerful inhibition of these thalamocortical relay neurons gates the information that makes it from the senses to the thalamus to the cortex. So it's the major inhibitory neuron uh, nucleus of the thalamus. And the TRN, oops, the TRN has been shown to be abnormal in schizophrenia. There is a reduction of parvalbumin expressing GABA neurons um, and a reduction in perineuronal nets, which nurture and support these neurons. So the TRN is entirely comprised of GABAergic inhibitory neurons, and there's a reduction in um, schizophrenia. So what might we expect if as a consequence of TRN abnormalities, there was an impaired inhibition of thalamocortical relay in schizophrenia? So one possibility is that there would be increased and less filtered forwarding of sensory information from the thalamus to the cortex. And this could lead to the fragmentation of attention that is such a hallmark sign in schizophrenia and is captured by this patient account. Recently, I've noticed that noises all seem to be louder to me than they were before. I notice it most with background noises, noises that are always around, but you just don't notice them. Now they seem to be just as loud and sometimes louder than the main noises that are going on. It's a bit alarming at times because it makes it difficult to keep your mind on something when there's so much going on that you can't help listening to. And so we might also expect a corresponding deficit in sensory gating. So normally there, so normally you see after presenting an auditory stimulus, if you present an identical auditory stimulus close in time, you see an attenuation of the neural response of the P50 event-related potential, suggesting that this redundant information was gated by the TRM. And in schizophrenia and in their relatives, the sensory gating is markedly reduced. So they're having reduced ability to gate out irrelevant sensory information. Another um, feature that you might expect in the context of a failure of TRN inhibition of thalamocortical relay is the very well replicated finding of hyperconnectivity between the thalamus and the cortex as measured with resting state functional connectivity MRI. And you'll notice it's with sensory motor cortex. This is increased connectivity, abnormally increased connectivity in schizophrenia. In the same subjects, we also found a spindle deficit. This is just a topographic map showing you where patients with schizophrenia had reductions in spindles compared to healthy controls. And importantly, these two deficits, the hyperconnectivity and the spindle density deficit were correlated, consistent with the hypothesis that both measures index the functioning of TRN-mediated thalamocortical circuitry. And in schizophrenia, a failure of this inhibition leads to the reduction of burst firing that gives rise to spindles during sleep and a reduction of the gating that, um, that controls redundant information during wake, leading to increased connectivity. So theoretically, we have a mechanism, reduced TRN inhibition of thalamocortical neurons that can contribute to several putative endophenotypes of schizophrenia. The spindle deficits during sleep, reduced sensory gating, and thalamocortical hyperconnectivity during wake. And so this provides a very strong impetus to treat this um, deficit to treat the TRN-mediated thalamocortical dysfunction. So we started trying to treat this 
using the drug, the non-benzodiazepine sedative hypnotic azopiclone. And the rationale was that azopiclone acts on GABA B, excuse me, GABA A receptor subunits that are preferentially expressed on the TRN. And in a small preliminary um, drug company sponsored study, we found that azopiclone significantly increased spindles in schizophrenia. But its effect on memory was not significant. And this might have reflected that we were underpowered. This was a small sample study. So we moved to a larger NIMH-supported crossover trial of azopiclone in both schizophrenia and control participants to ask the question, can azopiclone improve memory? And so we replicated our finding that patients had widespread deficits in spindles, and azopiclone increased spindles both in healthy controls and in patients with schizophrenia. And as in our prior studies, the density of spindles correlated with the amount of overnight improvement on the MST. However, sadly, um, despite increasing spindles, azopiclone did not improve memory and may have made it slightly worse. That's a trend level difference in schizophrenia. So what gives? Spindles are a mechanism of memory consolidation um, that correlate and and azopiclone increases spindles, but it does not improve memory. So that, that brings up an important question of why. And that's what the remainder of the talk will try to answer. And I think the answer to this question has to do with the fact that our model was too simple. Spindles don't act in isolation to improve memory. They are temporally correlated and occur in the excitable upstates of neocortical slow oscillations and hippocampal ripples, which represent memory reactivation occurrence in spindle troughs. And it is the dialogue between these three cardinal oscillations of non-REM sleep that is thought to result in moving memory from temporary store in the hippocampus to more permanent representation in the neocortex. So, and what we found in schizophrenia was that spindle density was important for memory improvement, but so was the timing of spindles in relation to slow oscillations. And together, both the timing and density of spindles predicted memory consolidation significantly better than either density or timing alone, suggesting that they are both important. So does considering slow oscillations and their coupling with spindles help us to solve the memory of why increasing spindles with azopiclone does not improve memory? And I think it does. And what we found in analyzing our clinical trial data is that slow spindles that are coupled, in other words, that are peaking in um, slow oscillations, the density of coupled, these coupled events predicts memory significantly better than spindles alone, both in healthy subjects and schizophrenia subjects. And interestingly, azopiclone disrupted slow oscillations. They reduced, azopiclone reduced the amplitude of slow oscillations and also reduced the consistency of the timing of their um, peaking during the slow oscillations. And these two findings were related. So these less powerful slow oscillations, the more, let me put it this way, the more powerful the slow oscillation was, the more consistent the timing was. So weaker slow oscillations on azopiclone were less able to consistently group spindles into their excitable upstates, disrupting the dialogue between the spindles from the thalamus and the neocortical slow oscillations. And so what this, what this suggests is that any intervention is going to have to preserve or enhance that dialogue in order to improve memory. Now, what about hippocampal ripples? 
We are not able to see them using Scalp EEG. So we went to colleagues at MIT who, can, who had a preparation where they were able to measure um, ripples from CA1, excuse me, um, ripples from CA1 of the hippocampus at the same time as spindles from the cortex, as spindles from the thalamus and um, slow oscillations in the cortex. And what they found was that azopiclone decreased ripple power. So this may be another reason that azopiclone failed to improve memory. And wouldn't it have been nice to have known this before embarking on this expensive and time-consuming clinical trial? So now Matt Wilson and I um, have a collaboration where we are looking at the effects of potential treatments for the spindle deficit on all three oscillations together in rodents and also on memory before moving to human studies as a prelude to clinical trials. But how do we decide which drugs to test? Genetic studies are beginning to find clues. They're beginning to provide clues. And this was a Herculean effort on the part of Sean Purcell, who characterized spindles in almost 12,000 individuals. And what he found was that spindle density and other spindle phenotypes were very strongly heritable consistent with a very substantial genetic component. And in a subset, and a growing subset of the sample, Sean has shown that spindle phenotypes correlate with polygenic risk scores. So the more genetic risk you have for schizophrenia, the less spindle activity you have. And, um, the eventual goal is to try to decipher the genetic architecture of spindles using this sample because they all have GWAS data. But some of the genes that contribute to spindles have already been discovered. So this was um, a GWAS study that found um, that CACNA1i is a risk gene in schizophrenia. Um, CACNA1i encodes a calcium channel, the CAV 3.3 calcium channel that is selectively expressed in the brain and particularly in the thalamic reticular nucleus and the hippocampus. And when you knock this um, channel out in a mouse model, you get a sleep spindle deficit. Interestingly, there have also been individuals with schizophrenia with de novo mutations of this gene implicating CACNA1i in both rare and common variation in schizophrenia risk and suggesting the possibility of um, an etiological role. So colleagues at the Broad Institute um, have replicated these two genetic de novo mutations of CACNA1i in a rodent model, in a mouse model. And what they found is that one of them is damaging the R mutation causes reduced trafficking of the CAV 3.3 channel to the surface of the cell membrane and reduced burst firing necessary for spindles. It also causes a spindle deficit in the knockout mouse. And they are now working to develop compounds that can correct the, the channel misfunction and that we can test in our pipeline in humans if it works. So how might an early genetic hit to the TRN <coughs> um, predispose to schizophrenia? So rodent studies, again, are finding clues, are providing clues. During gestation, all neurons passing between the thalamus and the cortex have to pass through the TRN, which guides them to their termination. And early in postnatal life, spindle bursts, which are a precursor to adult sleep spindles, are important in refining and wiring the lamocortical circuitry. So you can imagine that if there's a genetically mediated TRN abnormality, it could disrupt the, the formation of the lamocortical circuitry and predispose someone to the later development of a neurodevelopmental disorder such as schizophrenia. So, Again, strong impetus to um, treat 
the spindle deficit and pharmacology is not the only option. Um, in newer work in our lab, we are moving to using auditory stimulation during slow oscillation upstates to try to enhance the coordination of spindles with slow oscillations. And believe it or not, that seems to be um, effective in previous literature and, and we're having some success with that. So what we're doing is we're detecting online a slow oscillation downstate. We're stimulating about 400 milliseconds later. We're just playing a short noise burst, and then we're measuring the electrophysiological activity. And what we see is that compared to detecting slow oscillations only, so no stimulation, stimulation in red is more likely to trigger. These are significant stars is more likely to trigger another slow oscillation and increases sigma power, which are associated with spindles. And it's also increasing spindle density, as well as increasing the density of spindle slow oscillation coupled events that are important for memory. Um, closed loop auditory stimulation, this is not yet significant. It doesn't reach significant, but it also seems in healthy people to be improving memory. And we, we're a little bit underpowered for this. So we're continuing to uh, collect subjects when COVID resolves. So the plan is to move to schizophrenia and see if this can help um, in schizophrenia. So, I mean, I think the importance of this work is that what it's showing is that successful interventions are going to have to enhance function at the network level, not just spindles, but cortical slow oscillations and hippocampal ripples. And um, this becomes important because there are commercially available devices that could potentially deliver this type of stimulation in the home. So this becomes a scalable and tractable treatment. And we're just beginning to look at the effects of auditory stimulation on hippocampal ripples as well in um, patients who are undergoing continuous EEG monitoring in the hippocampus for um, epilepsy. So we will be able to see the effects of stimulation on all three oscillations. Since all three oscillations, this triple phase locking of the slow oscillations, the lamic spindles, and the hippocampal ripples is critical for memory. So to try to summarize, the story that I've told you, the aims of this highly collaborative research program is to try to forge empirical links in hypothetical causal chains from genes to diagnosis. And the ultimate goal is to identify treatments. We started with simple memory consolidation study showing deficits of sleep dependent memory consolidation and schizophrenia. This deficit occurred in the context of the sleep spindle deficit and importantly, these two deficits were correlated, suggesting that the sleep spindle deficit caused the memory deficit. The sleep spindle deficit implicates the TRN and the thalamocortical circuitry that it mediates. This could give rise to thalamocortical hyperconnectivity, impaired sensory gating, which in turn might contribute to the symptoms, positive symptoms that we see in schizophrenia. That was a story I didn't have time to tell you about. Um, we're beginning to identify genes that impact spin risk genes that impact spindle physiology and that when knocked out in mouse models cause a specific um, spindle deficit and it's obviously not one gene but many genes that probably contribute to spindle deficits and schizophrenia setting off a cascade that can lead to neurodevelopmental disorders such as schizophrenia and autism and so with that, I would just like to thank the army of people in both mine and Bob's lab over the years who have contributed to this work and to the MGHCRC and the nurses there and especially to our participants and our funding sources. So thank you very much for your attention.